Hello and thank you for joining us today for this Onc Live Peer Exchange panel discussion entitled Global Insight on Advanced Breast Cancer Management. As research in the field of breast cancer continues to flourish, we are advancing at an unprecedented pace toward a more personalized approach to treatment. Today I am joined by a distinguished panel of internationally known experts in breast oncology. We will focus our discussion on refining the use of targeted therapies for treatment of advanced disease and improving outcomes after progression. We'll provide perspective on the latest research findings from ESMO 2017 and their application to clinical practice. I am Dr. Adam Brofsky and I am Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh and Associate Director for Clinical Investigation at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Michael Ganant, Professor of Surgery and Director of the Department of Surgery at the Medical University of Vienna, Austria. Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy, Chair of Breast Cancer Research at Baylor University Medical Center, Texas Oncology and U.S. Oncology in Dallas, Texas. Dr. Hope Rugo, Professor of Medicine and Director of Breast Oncology and Clinical Trials Education at the University of California, San Francisco, Helen Diller Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. And Dr. Michael Unch, Professor of Medicine at the Clinic for Gynecology and Gynecologic Oncology Obstetrics and Head of the Interdisciplinary Breast Cancer Center of the Helios Clinicum Berlin Buch in Berlin, Germany. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's begin. So the first thing we want to talk about, I think, is something that uh, really uh, has taken, I think, uh, at least the ER positive uh, part of the metastatic breast cancer uh, world by storm. Uh, and that's CDK4-6 inhibitors. And so Joyce, um, how are you now using CDK4-6 inhibitors in your practice right now? You know, I am pretty much recommending um, either palbocyclib or ribocyclib now first line metastatic with letrozole. Mm -hmm. um, initially, I wasn't really sure that some patients with de novo metastatic disease or small volume asymptomatic bone only really w required it. But the reason I'm doing it now pretty much across the board as I've gotten more experience is that every single subset you look at, including the de novo metastatic, for example, in the Mona Lisa 2, there are Kaplan-Meier curves looking at letrozole plus minus ribocyclib, and the curves are very, very much apart in favor of the ribocyclib and for the de novo metastatic. So I'm like, I don't have any data not to give these patients every single subset benefits. So, so that's what, I, what I'm doing in practice now. So the question I have, though, even before we, we get going on that, I mean, the FDA in the U.S. did something that was highly unusual, and that is they approved these drugs, palbociclib in particular, on the basis of a 160-patient phase two trial. Hope you want to comment on that on Paloma 1? You know, it's very interesting because we were busy preparing to go to ODAC to discuss this. I and remember that. Uh, which seemed a reasonable <laughs> approach for a randomized phase two trial. Uh, and then the FDA approved it, gave it accelerated approval. I actually think that in this situation, it was quite reasonable. It gave people access to the drug. They had a, you know, it's the, uh, similar to pertuzumab in that a randomized phase three trial had been completed. So the accrual had already been completed. So they didn't have to worry about not getting the final results. They didn't have safety concerns that hadn't been well described, and the safety concerns had already been added to from the randomized phase three trial, Paloma II, uh, and then there was evidence of a significant prolongation of progression-free survival. So I think in many ways it just gave people the option to use the drug while we waited for the final information without a big risk other than financial. Okay, and so we had Paloma one, and so let me ask my European colleagues, I mean, Michael, I mean, your, the European EMA did not accept that data, correct? They would not accept the initial Paloma 1 data for approval? Uh, well, the European uh, approval, co um, uh, um, the approval uh, the agency approved the drug, and it is approved, like in Germany, since uh, November 2016. But we have a second institution in Germany, which we call GBA. It's similar to NICE in UK. And uh, this institution said, uh, well, uh, progression-free survival as an endpoint does not convince us enough. And now the pharmaceutical company has to negotiate with the insurance company about the price. So it's not about approving the drug. The drug is approved and the sales, to be very honest, in the last uh, seven months went up and up and up because we use a lot this drug 
And now with the approval of ribocyclib in Germany or in Europe since one week or this week, we have a second player on the market which is good for the patients. And again, we have to start then the next talk with the GBA about is it enough to have progression-free survival as an endpoint? And my opinion is yes, it is enough. And uh, we were waiting, to be very honest, for this kind of drug since more than 10 years because in the area of endocrine treatment of breast cancer patients, the last innovation has been aromatase inhibition, and that was it. So I actually, I'm very happy to have these drugs now on the market, and we have to continue discussing this topic of uh, endpoints, uh, and that is not the last time we are going to discuss this, because probably with FDA, this is go also going to be a discussion about the endpoints of randomized clinical trials in oncology. Right. I mean, Austria, what do you think? From the Austrian perspective, what we, we as always, are a bit luckier than our German our colleagues. You know, we have had rapid reimbursement uh, for Palbo, and we expect it for for ribocyclib as well. Um, however, I think that Michael has said that we were waiting in this. Mo after all, this is the most common subtype of breast cancer, and you know, for the last decade or so, we were all giving talks on personalized treatment, on the breakthroughs in targeted, but essentially, it was all her two and maybe sometimes triple negative. Um, and with the exception of mTOR inhibition, um, we have all been waiting almost for two decades. So I think part of that rapid move of the FDA may also reflect the clinical need uh, in patients with homoreceptor right. positive HER2 negative breast cancer. Having said this, um, and I think we see extremely consistent data in the in the Paloma set of trials, obviously in the Mona Lisa trials, and and also uh, with abemaciclib with a little delay, I believe as scientific community we have so far failed to identify a biomarker that would help us to apply these uh, um, interesting but also very expensive agents in a very rational way. So. I started the same way as Joyce has reported. You know, I was, I think there must be patients out there who respond well with that smoldering bone only um, indolent disease. Uh, and yes, we have them all. I mean, three years of uh, perfect response to letrozole alone. I mean, we, we saw this in the past. But then when you look into the subgroups and you see that bone only, for example, uh, in Paloma 2, is, uh, you know, actually the hazard ratio is 0.3. And then you, you get down to the crunch question, you know, what would you do if this is your mother and she has bone-only disease? And are you now saying, well, you are the patient for full restaurant only? So this is really very difficult. On the other hand, and that may not be as limiting in, in clinical practice in the U.S. for now, uh, but in, in many European environments, uh, um, cost is really an issue. And uh, I think that it is very important that we keep trying to do these translational studies, to collect tissues and, and biomaterials uh, um, throughout all these clinical trials in order to eventually be able to find a better rational for the algorithm of multi-line treatment. 